think about it, when something is scaring you, your whole attention narrows to the thing that's frightening you, as it should, because you have to protect yourself. That's adaptive. So if you have teachers and students who are scared, they're focusing on a single thing and their system is not open to learning in a broad way. Bonnie, welcome to the show. For anybody that isn't aware of you and your work, could you just give us a bit of an introduction to who is Bonnie Badendock? And I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correct there. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> um, sure, it's lovely. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and be here today. Um, I've been a trauma therapist and a, a author and a supervisor and mentor and all that kind of thing for about 35 years. Um, Prior to that, I was a college prof, so I had a lot of interest also in literature and in mysticism, That's which is what my doctorate is in. And so I have found that these fields of study blend really beautifully as far as helping us learn how to be present with people in a way that makes room for their inner healing wisdom to show up. So and that's been really the thrust of my whole career, whether regardless of what I'm doing is that, is to help people prepare a safe enough space that that our people can come in who have been wounded, find a place to settle, and then find a place for the healing to unfold because they feel the quiet and the safety of being held there. Very cool. Now, could you tell me about some of the major influences on your thinking, some of the people that have really impacted your philosophy on therapy and, and your work? Yeah, I mean, I go back to in my uh, 40s is when I actually switched careers and I had gotten some of my own healing. And that's what prompted me to want to pursue this as my career instead of teaching. And so I would say that that first therapist that I had was a very enormous influence on me. And especially I know today we're going to talk about inner community. So he's a man back in the in the 80s, who had a real strong intuitive sense about this. So I got to experience it firsthand. So I think that the, that and another person who in my 60s was a such a powerful craniosacral person, was such a powerful one to let me experience what it's like to be held in stillness and how that is what the healing, where the healing can really emerge. And so I would say that those two people, rather than academic people, the people I've had experiences with are the strongest influences. But I was very taken also with Kohut's work when I was in uh, college, when I was in grad school, and, and very much found that his emphasis on empathy and on how empathy lays the foundation for all healing was was very important for me. And of late, I would say, I, I, mean, I, I was fortunate enough to be in a study group with Dan Siegel for five years, around starting around 2000 and around, I guess, 2003. That was a wonderful experience of really deepening me into the science of all of this and, and how that gives us a foundation. And then coming out of that, Stephen Porges and Ian McGilchrist, I would say, are two people who are like with me every day. In our study groups, we put a pillow on the floor for each of them so that they can be present. <laughs> so. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. You know, even I'm only, I've only feel like I've only discovered your work recently, Bonnie, um, and I feel I haven't even scratched the surface mm -hmm. slightly. But f even from from the point of view I currently have, you seem to have your view is multi-dimensional and multi-perspectival you know it's very it's very broad and you've you've brought in so many different things that I don't think were previously connected so something I was kind of curious to ask you is you know you seem to be a great synthesizer of um, information so I just you know if anybody wants to sort of take that kind of uh, approach to their own their own work have you got any sort of broad tips um, that might be helpful for them? Well, it's an interesting question because I do think that, that if, if I have a particular strength, it's being very interested in seeing how different theorists, how the scientists, how those who have done theoretical work talk to each other if you bring them into the same room. You know, if you bring them into your mind, the room of your mind, and begin to hear what they're saying, I think what emerges is a, quite a, an important and beautiful picture of really what, how we human beings get hurt, 
how we human beings heal, and that everybody's saying similar things, but from different angles. When you talk about the science of it, when we talk about Porges and McGilchrist and Siegel and Cozzolino and Shore and on and on, Yak Pongsep, lots of other people, that they that as we let them play together, we begin to get a sense of guidance about how to be with our people in a way that maximizes healing. And I love doing that. I don't know. It just feels like it's just something I was born with as a an interest in seeing what happens when you bring people together. So I wasn't an English major when I went to college. I was a comparative literature major <laughs> so that okay. I could hear people from all different cultures. And I, so I think it's just something that's part of how I operate in this world. And I think it's really good to get all these different perspectives and see what they're saying. And you've discovered that within all of these different uh, perspectives and paradigms, some underlying principles that that maybe unite unite them all is that fair mm -hmm. to say yes that is fair to say and i think guess you could sum it up by saying we get hurt in relationships and we also heal that way and that, that whether we're talking about porges in the autonomic nervous system or we're talking about mcgilchrist in the two hemispheres of the brain or punks up on the midbrain all of them are saying pointing to the same kind of thing which Core just sums up by saying connection is a biological imperative and the co-regulation is really how we move about in this world and it's certainly how we heal. And that when we get away from that, which our very left dominant cultures in the West have gotten, we all get hurt. We all get traumatized by the lack of connection, even when there aren't other major traumas going on. That that is, is so wounding. So that's how we heal For too. Sure. We come back together. In our last discussion with, with our friend uh, Lee Mahani, we talked a little bit about your concept of inner community. Could you maybe just, uh, yeah. for anyone that hasn't heard that conversation, maybe just give us an introduction to, to what that is and maybe how you, your background as an attachment-based therapist might have um, helped to contribute to that understanding. Yes, I think that contributed, but I would honestly say the thing that contributed the most, again, was that first therapist that was really of help to me coming out of a really traumatized childhood helped me experience how true it is that we in a felt sense way can know that we have internalized all the people that we've had emotionally meaningful connections with and that means parents certainly and it means also teachers and it means friends and it means anybody for, who's had an emotional uh, impact on us. We have the neural capacity to take them in. And we have then inside of us, we are kind of built out of these dyads or triads if there's more than two people, but that we're built out of my experience of them and then taking in their experience of what's going on. And these form permanent connections that are neurobiologically encoded in our brain. And these relationships continue then to form the way we see the world, the way we are in relationships and all those kinds of things. Wow. And I assume because of neuroplasticity, this is a, a lifelong process. Like it doesn't just end in childhood. Like we're continuously doing this. Like, could we even say that I might be internalizing part of you during this conversation and then yeah. that then influences me and then it passes on. Exactly. And so we had did have that other conversation with Liam as well. So I come into this conversation with you already having a felt sense of you inside of me. And so I feel really relaxed coming in today where I felt unsure when I first when we first started, you know, when we were with Liam because I didn't know you. But now I know a little bit of you, and so I have you as part of me, and I come come here to this conversation today with that feeling. So it's very lovely. Now, if you'd been really scary, it wouldn't be so lovely. You know, it would be it would be a scarier situation. But you are just not. So I come in with this already positive of who you are and of of how you operate, and that you really want conversation, which I really like. So to me, this. This is a fascinating idea, and it, I think it'll. There's also a quite a, a level of responsibility with it as well, because if we know that we are continuously being influenced by others and influencing others in ways that are going to stay with them at a neurobiological mm -hmm. level, it really puts a yeah. responsibility on us to make sure that we are um, doing whatever we can to to transmit a presence into the world that is 
beneficial for the people around us and not not destructive yes that would be wonderful if we could do more of that for sure you know i think that that when we meet people who have a natural kindness about them and they come toward us something does heal inside of us it, it lets us take in a sense of hope that life can be this good you know that we can be kind to one another even in times of pain and difficulty and struggle but if we meet with people who are pretty disconnected from probably themselves first, but then also from others and are only interested in performance and interested in goals and interested in getting something to happen, then that hurts us inside because we don't feel met and we don't feel joined. So I do think we have a big responsibility both as a culture and also as individuals to take care of our own inner health, our own inner settledness and connection with the resources of goodness and kindness that are inside of us, that are inside everybody, I believe, and have just gotten masked by all the everything we've been through from personal trauma to cultural trauma to historical. My goodness, we could just go on and on about all the impacts we've experienced, you know? So yes, being bringing a kindness into the world would be, it can be transformative for our culture if we made that a priority. Can you tell me about how the work of Ema Gilchrist has influenced your thinking and the, maybe the differences between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and how that affects how we relate with the world around us? And yeah, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yes. I, I am a devotee of Ian's work. It has been really so helpful, again, to put a kind of a frame around both what's happened in our field of psychology and how uh, we've gotten so focused on being with people around diagnosis and then treatment plans and then progress and all of these kinds of things in a way that precludes us from being human to human a lot of the time, being really present to one another and all of that. So I, it's been really important in that regard. But in the big picture, I think what Ian is talking about is whether we survive on this planet or not, because the left hemisphere turns everything into an object. So I'm looking out this window at this beautiful cedar tree that happens to be right outside my office window here. It's many stories tall and it's gorgeous. And I feel I have a relationship with that tree because I get to look at it every day and watch the wind play with it and really be present to it. So that would make it <laughs> impossible for me to want to cut this beautiful being down. But if I'm in my left hemisphere, then what I see is an object. And it would be quite possible to cut this tree down and turn it into a, you know, houses or whatever it is that people would do with this tree. So we can be really destructive of each other if we get locked into our left hemisphere, because then it's how do we use people? It isn't how can we be with people? So that's what the left does on its own. Now, it's very essential, very, very essential to our good functioning. But when it becomes dominant, then we lose our sense of being with one another. The right hemisphere is all about the space between me and the cedar tree, you and me, you and me and everybody else out there, you know, that will ever hear this and about a sense of connectedness. And so when that is in play, we again are taking in the other person and taking them into account if our right hemisphere isn't carrying too much embedded trauma. So if the right mm -hmm. hemisphere has, a, because what <laughs> all these things are, as I talk about them, it's it's like I want to say A and then and then say B, but I have to tell you about B before I can get to A kind of thing. So, <laughs> so when we have traumatic experience that isn't resolved, it's it lives in the body and in the right hemisphere subcortical world and affects how we function in the world. So if we're overloaded with a lot of trauma in the right hemisphere then it's going to be really difficult for us to have these living connections, even though the right hemisphere is capable of that, because we're in so much fear and so much pain because of what's happened to us. So the right hemisphere on its own, if it's got a lot of embedded trauma, doesn't do very well in the world either, because it feels chaotic, it feels frightened, it feels sometimes then like you have to strike out against people because you're so scared and all of that. But if the right hemisphere is not carrying so much trauma, then it's able to reach out an empathic way toward others with this kindness that we were talking about. And then the left hemisphere is meant to not run the show, but to support 
the right hemisphere with its wisdom about how things actually work in the world. So we, what we want are two hemispheres that can meet and come together in a supportive relationship of a particular kind, and then we'll be able to be with each other more easily and again in kindness and toward the planet as well, you know, toward anything in that way. So his work for me has really illuminates what's going on around here that's so scary, you know, for our planet, for the way we are with each other, for the divisiveness that we experience in politics, which I don't think is unique to the U.S., but it's certainly prevalent here, you know. So all of these things really make a lot of sense to me when we come to the place where we understand how these two hemispheres need each other and how all the traumatic experiences we've had have kind of made us shift into the left where we take control and grasp and try to make things go the way we need them to go, which is usually pretty destructive. Was what you were saying about um, the right hemisphere and if we're carrying a lot of trauma, maybe from our, our youth or whatever, then the right hemisphere is sort of occupied with like, you know, it's, it's not freed up. It's sort of occupied with that trauma. And then if you go through your process <laughs> of healing, you're gradually, um, freeing up your right hemisphere and your maybe your nervous system as well to experience more connection in the world and in life. Um, yeah. And then another thing that sort of jumps to mind for me here as well is um, Ian gave a talk with us. It was called uh, The Brain and Culture, A Symbiotic Relationship. And mm -hmm. in that talk, he basically explored how societies that flourish start off with a and he, he uses art, like uses art history to sort of illustrate the points here. But he says, societies that flourish, mm -hmm. they have a, a balance between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. They're sort of like the left is almost like serving the right a little bit. And then exactly. whenever he looked at societies like ancient Greece and ancient Rome, whenever they started to decline, it was a, a dominance of the left hemisphere. And that was reflected in the art as well. So what I'm sort of you know, getting at here is how do you feel about the current status statuses of our society and the hemispheres? Are we a left hemisphere dominated society at the moment? Yes. Capital. Yes. I mean, all we need to do okay. is <laughs> again, just cause I, I, I don't know that you have mostly therapists listening to this, but I imagine quite a few since, you know, with the kind of people you bring on here. So in our, in our particular field, a lot of the training is about what protocols to use, what interventions to use to fix somebody who has a particular diagnosis. So you can hear in the left that everybody gets put in a box of some sort called a diagnosis. And then we have these things called evidence-based practices that we then apply to the person. Me, the expert, knows what you need. And so then I will show you all these techniques and we'll move our way through this. And you will show progress because your symptoms will reduce. That is a, such a purely left hemisphere way to look at a human being. I don't see anybody who has a single diagnosis. They come in with all sorts of things going on from week to week if I make room for them. They come in one time having just had some lovely experience and want to just share that and be together, you know, in this kind of safe place to talk about this beautiful thing. And the next time they come in and they're anxious because something has stirred up the fear inside of them. And maybe the next time they come in, they're dissociating a little bit. We are human beings having unique experiences all the time. And so am I as the therapist. So I want to meet my people, human being to human being. And I want to, them to feel safe enough to share with me where they actually are that day and not feel like I'm running the show. The wisdom for them to heal is inside of them. Where we go next, their system will know what to do. If I can hold a safe place and then offer means to, to, to be with them really deeply where they are. So like I do sand tray therapy, I do inner kinds of work where we really get in touch with the body and we really see where these memories are coming from together. So I have a certain kind of knowledge that I can bring to them, but they're always guiding me about what direction to go in if I can only make it safe enough. And I, I work with severely traumatized people and they are quite capable of doing this as well if they feel safe enough. And then together we find our way. It's so different than applying something to somebody to get them to change. 
I imagine, Bonnie, that what you're saying is it requires a great deal more of humanity and courage to really sit with someone like that as opposed to sitting there in a subject-object relationship where I'm giving you advice and protocols on how you're going to going to change. It sounds like your approach, like there's so much more vulnerability in it than than what people are traditionally trained in, you know, which is scary. Well, it can be scary. I, it really can be scary. But I also believe that that if we have the left hemisphere has a, a kind of really deep knowledge of relational neuroscience is one pathway, certainly, of understanding what's happening in the brain and in the body and all of that. It provides a stability that lets us step out into the world of the other person just like you're saying, not knowing what's going to emerge next. I don't know what this what this person is going to touch next or how they're going to be. But if but if I have my left hemisphere engaged and studying from for about 20 years now relational neuroscience fairly deeply, I feel very like I've got this this platform that I can stand on. So if there's a lot of big emotions that come up, I have a way of thinking about that that helps stabilize me so I can stay connected right hemisphere to right hemisphere and be with that person. But it does take, it's a lot of work. It's also very relieving to not have to fix people. Oh my goodness, I don't know how to do that. (laughs) I don't know how to fix anybody. But I trust that inside of them, there is a wisdom that does know what direction we need to go. And part of that wisdom arises out of the inner community that they have inside as well. So that that perspective is also really helpful for me to be able to understand that I'm not dealing with a single self here, that we aren't being with that, that there's a whole inner community in me that is present with the inner community in you. And so that we can be together in that in that way which accounts, of course, for the variability in people. You know, it's not just a single self. There's so many other parts that are here. And we have all the science about that now, which is really exciting. The last time we spoke, Bonnie, you mentioned that maybe the most important thing, I might, I'm probably you know, getting the words wrong here, but this is sort of what I took from it. The most important thing that anybody can do for their mental health and well-being is to find someone where it's a a secure attachment relationship where you feel really safe and cared for in their company, because that is going to, you're going to internalize that. And then you're going to bring that to your relationships as well. Could you maybe expand a bit more on that and why this is so important? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the idea, and this goes to Stephen Porges's work in particular, when we have relationships that are that where we are received without judgment and without agenda, then our system can feel safe enough to become vulnerable, which lets us touch both the joys in life, but also to touch the pains in life really deeply. And so as a therapist, if I'm so many therapists in private practice that I've talked with over the years, say they don't have a single person in their life that they trust at that debt. So then they're having to carry all that their people bring and they have no place to take it where they trust that someone will just hear them and allow them to let this move through them and be released and be held by another person. So every therapist out there, I hope if you don't hear anything else today, I hope you hear how important it is to have, and it doesn't have to be one person. Obviously there can have, you can have several people. There's people I know that have generated these beautiful process groups now that maybe have four or five people that come together just to listen to one another and hold one another as they talk honestly and vulnerably about the pain that they're carrying just from being a therapist, you know? So it's vital and it's vital everywhere. <laughs> For us to be able to not have these things we take in embed as a trauma, but instead have what they need to be integrated throughout our system and not be carried forward from here. It absolutely requires having someone who listens without judgment and without agenda, with no intent to fix, no advice, nothing. Just listening really deeply and holding that space for the person to bring what it is that's inside of them to be held, and then it can integrate. It allows it allows the experience that lets the it integrate instead of embed as a trauma. In in your training with uh with Liam, our, our mutual friend, um, you as part of that you mm-hmm. offer or you do these list listening partnerships for someone listening to yeah. this 
that would like to set up a listing partnership with someone that they feel might be open to it, what would you recommend, like how they could best approach that? Well, I, I mean, again, I, I think it just depends on who's around you, you know, to look around and see who you have in your life that you think might also be yearning for that kind of relationship. Because in a listening partnership, you're sharing that, you know, you have you talk and the person holds you and then they have the opportunity to do the same. And that kind of thing, again, helps both people stay healthier and feel cared for and again change their implicit inner world in terms of 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 how available we can be to other people so i i don't know any other way except to begin to look around and see who's in your world that you think might be interested in that and begin to talk with each other and see if there is an interest in sharing that kind of a that kind of a relationship and the first thing you'll notice as you start to do that is that all of us begin to have an urge like, I want to give advice. I want to tell you what to do because that would feel better to me to feel like I was contributing something and to feel like I was helping you out of maybe a tough situation and to be able to talk honestly about that with the person. Like, I really want to do this right now and have the other person listen to you about why it feels important. So it's a, it's not one of these things where you come into it and you can do it perfectly well ever we don't do anything perfectly always you know it's just not we are humans and that isn't how we are but to come together and begin to explore what it's like when we even attempt to listen to each other without judgments and then being tender to ourselves when we can't do it right that moment you know and be able to talk with the person about that there's often a lot of laughter and humor and tenderness and um all of that that come into these relationships as we realize more and more fully how human we are and how we're never going to do all of the things that we think we should do properly, even though our left hemisphere tells us we must and then tortures us about it. And it's um, not that the left hemisphere is the bad guy. It's just that when it's the boss, it's punitive often and judgmental because that's what it knows how to do. That's why Ian's book, The Master and His Emissary, the master is the right, the emissary is the, whatever, that must mean the messenger or the servant or whatever, you know, the left, the left should serve the right. It is, it's, it's, again, it's the scaffolding that holds us with a kind of knowledge, you know, that it's very good at, but isn't trying to run the show. It's, it's just, uh, it's almost difficult to understand if we've been in mostly left hemisphere environments our whole lives. Because that's all our, our system then knows implicitly is how to do these kinds of things from a left shifted sort of way of, of control and goals and all this kind of stuff. So it takes a long time to begin to balance out into one where the right is more taking the lead and the left is the helper. It takes a long time. And I think we need kindness and humor and all that along the way as we seek to really change the way our brain is wired. It's not a it's not a cognitive decision we make it's practice it's practicing and practicing mm -hmm. so that our brain gradually is wired together in a different fashion we can't just make a decision about about it and have it change just something that's come to mind for me it sort of seems like the left is like a horizontal it's a horizontal thing and then the uh the right is more interested in depth and this uh vertical dimension you know this this deepening of consciousness mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, that just jumps to mind, but um, can you tell me about, you've got a course called Therapy as a Spiritual Practice. Can you tell me around your, why you named the course that there and do you view therapy in this way? Yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> As, as my wife and I are winding down from our major teaching duties and handing some of the, of the beginning classes off to long-term people who've been with us for a very long time and are really very skilled in all of this and really want to offer it, we were trying to figure out what it is we actually want to still do and as we're you know turning into old people here pretty quickly. <laughs> and the one thing we felt we really still wanted to hold on to was what we had discovered over the years was that as we more and more begin to practice stillness inside and we begin to, as we heal and we become more and more able to open this non-judgmental space through practice, that really that stillness is at the core of all the mystical traditions in the world. If you think about it, wow. being present is what those traditions are about. Now you're present maybe to Jesus or you're present to 
um, nirvana or you're present to the Tao or you're present to, you know, various kinds of things. But still, the practice of being in the present moment with whatever it is is your focus for your for your spiritual practice is really what we've been doing as therapists, what we've been trying to do more and more as therapists. So that's how this idea started to come about. And then when we think about it from the client's side, the person, the people who come to us side, we're really in the business of helping them be more whole. And the more whole we are, meaning not single self, but the more we have inside of us a sense of, of the peaceful relationships between all of these inner community members, the more and more there is a peace there, the more we can be a container for whatever kind of spiritual experience might come along. I know early on in my, I've had a, an interest in spirituality since I was little. My grandfather was a Rosicrucian, and so I, from the time I was three to 11, was kind of bathing in that atmosphere with him, meaning he was a, a mystic of a old Christian tradition was, was what a Rosicrucian person is. <clears throat> and then I had other exposures along the way to spiritual practices as well. So I realized I've had an interest in this area. But in my 20s and 30s, because I was carrying so much trauma, even if I would have a glimmer of a spiritual experience, it would just drain through me because there was not enough wholeness inside of me to, to hold it and for it to develop because my insides were so fragmented and so full of pain and, and this kind of thing and fear and all of that. And that as I healed over time, especially in my 40s and on, gradually my, my inter interior world became more able to have a spiritual experience that could last longer, that could stay with me, that didn't just kind of fall through these fragmented spaces. So I believe all of us, whether we know it or not, are offering the opportunity for people to have more wholeness inside, less trauma. And so if they have a spiritual inclination, they'll be in much better position to be able to have it really stay with them and begin to change their lives. So we're, we're we are support for whole making, I think, W-H-O-L-E, making things whole for our people. We don't make them whole. We, we help the obstacles to wholeness be removed so that it's possible for people to hold more spiritual experience. So both from our sense of being present from as, a, as therapist and then also of helping others be more whole, it feels to me like therapy is very much a spiritual practice for everybody involved. I even love the language you use, Bonnie, our people, not our patients, our clients, our people. You know, I think there's something very, very powerful about what you're saying there. Um, can you tell me about when your grandfather passed away when you were, I think, quite young, 11 or 12 or so? Yeah. You had a, an experience that was quite impactful. Can you maybe tell us a bit about that and well, how that I, influenced yeah. you? Yeah, my in, in a <clears throat> excuse me, in a in a really highly abusive household, my grandfather was sometimes fairly often a, re a refuge for me, not only because of his kind of mystical inclination, but he actually um, had, had a real love for me in a way he didn't with many people. <clears throat> so he meant a lot to me and, and was, a, again, a kind of safe place for me a lot of the time. So I was 11 years old and I went off to school and my grandfather was fine. My grandfather and grandmother actually lived with us in a house right behind our house. So I saw them every day and he was fine when I left for school. And about 11 o'clock in the morning, I had this sense of my grandfather behind me, putting his arms around me and saying, it'll be okay. I didn't think any more about it. It was as tangible as, you know, touching anything right now. I mean, it was very tangible. But then I just kind of forgot about it, went on about my day. And when I got home that afternoon, there was two men working in the front yard doing some plumbing stuff. And they said, we're so sorry to tell you, but your grandfather passed away this morning. He had died very shortly after I went to school of a massive heart attack. So he came to me and I and let me know. And uh, it really pretty much takes away any fear I have of of death or the idea that we just are gone or anything like that, you know, I mean, because again, it was as tangible as any, anything that's ever happened to me. So 
that was a very tender kindness on his part to do that. And I, and I know, so it was about three hours after, well, maybe two and a half hours after he died that he came. So I'm eternally grateful to my grandfather for that experience. So what do you think that says about, I suppose, the nature of reality and the world that we live in, that that, that happened? Interestingly enough, I find trying to read about theories about consciousness something I can't take in very well and don't have a lot of interest in. But what I am very interested in is is the nature of um, what it is to be a human being to be here on this planet now. And I, I mean, this, this may sound like a roundabout answer, but it, this is something I actually think a lot about that I think relates to this. And that is our human, ex- our human body, our neural system, takes in very, 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 very little of what's actually going on around here. We take in an almost an infinite amount of information into our system, and then our system is set up to filter out mo- almost all of it because it would overwhelm us. Our system can't hold that. I mean, you even think just about sound. You know, we have a little bandwidth of sound. We have a little bandwidth of light that we're available to, that we our system can take in. And again, so much that comes into us is simply filtered out. And then we have billions of neural firing patterns. And at any one time, we can only have seven to nine things on the plate of working memory. So billions of neural firing hmm full of information, and we can become aware of seven to nine things. We're not very conscious. We can't be. And so, and and it's a good thing because if we were conscious of a whole lot more, we probably wouldn't survive, you know, because it would be too much for this limited little container that still lets me see sunsets that make me cry and relate to this cedar tree and give me all of this amazing experience but if it were more intense or bigger than that, I wouldn't, my nervous system couldn't hold it, you know. So, so what I think is, is I have no idea what's going on around here, but I have thoughts like there might be legions of all kinds of beings around here that I can't have any awareness of because of the limitations of my body. So I don't have an opinion about everything that's going on around here because I know I don't know much. And I'm quite <laughs> that way. <laughs> That's beautifully said, Bonnie. And, you know, if you think about it, all that we can experience is what our five senses give us access to. And who's to, who's to say that there isn't all kinds of things going on outside of that five senses that we just don't have access to? And, you know, when they think like with the, there's a guy, Bernardo Castro, he's a big thinker on consciousness. And one of the things he talks about is that whenever they put people in, people on psychedelics in fMRI scanners, you would expect, you know, a massive increase in brain activity. But what they actually find is this huge reduction, like a massive quieting of like the, I don't know, whatever the, the network is responsible for the sense of self, like a massive quieting there. And yeah. what's interesting about that is that correlates with an enrichment of experience. People like see all of these things and have all these really like meaningful experiences. So it's sort of like it, chimes well with your idea here that our brain is actually filtering out a lot of what's actually there you know and i don't know this is a massive detour but it's interesting to think about well it is interesting to think about and it leads to a place for me that really matters which is that the humility of who we are as human beings can be really helpful to keep us from going off into the left hemisphere and thinking we can control everything and thinking that it's our job somehow to make things happen in a certain way and all of that, instead of having the, the, the lovely experience of just being humans, whether we're therapists or politicians or whoever it is, that we're just human beings together, where I believe the point of, of our neurobiology actually is to be able to manifest the highest and best in us, which has to do with our capacity to offer empathy to one another and be in connection with each other and care about one another. That's really our design. You know, Freud Freud made us out to be, and I first have to say, I'm immensely grateful to Freud because if he hadn't looked inward, maybe we still wouldn't be doing that. 
but because of the, the the environment that he grew up in, it makes it sound like there's a war going on all the time inside of us, according to Freud, you know, that there's, there's the, you know, the id, which is trying to run crazy, and then there's the ego, and then there's a superego that's trying to control everything, and it's always a battle. We know that isn't true now. I mean, this is one of the beautiful things about neurobiology. We know that our system is set up that in our DNA and the very makeup of who we are, we are set up to connect with one another in these warm ways. And that when as children, we get those connections, the capacity for empathy and care for others develops naturally out of how we're cared for. And then it's impacted by our culture and, you know, everything else that goes on around us. But that, that foundationally, we are set up to be an empathic, caring group of people. Were we not being impacted by so much else that has happened to us, you know, to our parents and our grandparents and epigenetically back through history? But we're meant to be together in these warm kind of ways. And if we can begin to get at that and get the sense that that's what life is really about, is ourselves doing that and being available to others and being responsible for our own mental health and working with our traumas, this planet could look very different than it does now. But there's, there's so much wounding that has come down through history that it's a long, long journey. And I think each one of us has to take that journey in whatever way we're able to do. To me, what you're talking about here is sort of like a, a route back to sanity for the human race. And it just, it's just, it seems so simple, but yet so out of reach for, for most of us. And something that uh, comes to mind for me here is in reading that book, The, the Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, he talks, you know, there's a bit of dialogue in that uh, in that book where he's being asked questions and then he's responding. So one of the questions, the woman said, you know, if, are you saying that there's something wrong with me? Because so, he's speaking about the ego. And she, are, you, are you saying there's something fundamentally wrong with me? Like, I don't like having that view of myself. And he just turns around and says, of course, you're part of the human race. This is the, this is the same race that has spent the past century millions and millions of people have died for no reason we're part of a collective insanity here and until we wake up to the, re to the reality of that and start moving back towards you know our, our true nature then um it's uh no real change is going to happen but it but it does it, it is possible to begin to go back to that i mean the most important thing for me about all of this is that we are born with the with the neural equipment to be able to do this with the right support mm. it isn't like we're ruined i mean so the idea that is so prevalent in western culture of original sin kinds of things isn't in my view what what is really true what's true is we have an original capacity and in innocence and then things happen, but it's not gone. It doesn't die. It doesn't get killed off. It just gets covered up and, and, and by all this wounding, but it's still there. And if we can begin to align with that, even though we don't know how to get back there, but if we begin to align with the truth that it's still there, then maybe we begin to find together some pathways back. I think I love that idea of original innocence. Um, you should You should really get that out there. Um, so can you tell me about the, uh, some, some of the research in this area is absolutely fascinating about, um, maybe some of the work of James Cohen and also I think Carl Marcy and this, the galvanic skin response in, in mm -hmm. therapy. Can you tell us about that? I find that particularly helpful for understanding this. Yeah. I mean, I, what the, the, well, their, their two things are different, but they, they lead certainly in a similar direction. So James Cohen and uh, Lane Becks did some research that they call social baseline theory. And they were interested to see what happens when people who are either in a, doing a difficult task or are in pain come together with somebody. So they, they measure what's going on. If I see a picture of a mountain and it looks like I could no more climb that than, you know, it's not even possible. I'm by myself. And what they discover is if somebody who feels kind comes, even though they're a stranger, but you have, you know, some sense that they're a helpful person, that task looks easier. And if you have a trusted beloved come, it looks much easier. 
And the same goes for the reduction in pain, that by myself, my pain is intense with a trusted stranger, a trustworthy feeling stranger, it gets less. And then it gets even more reduced if a trusted beloved is there. So they began then to look at what's going on in the brain. And this is this to me, I mean, that that first piece we probably intuitively know is true because we've all experienced it. But it was what they found when they looked in the brain that was so interesting. So they expected, this is the hand model that Dan Siegel does of, the, of our brain. This is the subcortex and this is the neocortex here. So we think ordinarily that our, our, our feelings of, say, fear or whatever are activated here in this amygdala limbic area. And that the prefrontal cortex is what regulates that so that you don't feel that so much chemicals get exchanged and all of this. So they were ex what they expected to see was that when they when some when a trusted beloved came, that there was a lot more firing in the prefrontal cortex, which would help to regulate the fear, the pain that's going on in here. That isn't what happened mm -hmm. at all. There was less firing here. What happens is, is that when we come together with somebody we trust. Both people's amygdalae, which are where we get these generate get these feelings of anxiety and all that, are generated when there's something scary going on. Both of them get less just because we have evolved, as they say, to anticipate being in a nest of warm connection, and that anything less than that is a violation of our neurobiology. As a therapist, it's very heartening to me to know that when I open the door to my office and someone comes in that we see one another and we have this sense of trust between us and we are both healing in that moment without doing anything. Just by coming together in a felt sense of trust in each other. That's how powerful we are for one another when we're in that kind of state. So that goes back to listening partners. That goes back to having people that we know we can just open to and that they'll hold us and hear us. And to know that the person who's listening to us is also healing while they're listening. Amygdala is calming. And what about uh, Carl Marcy and his research? Carl Marcy's research was, was interesting. This is a long time ago when I saw it. I don't know, maybe as much as 20 years ago, but he was very interested in what's going on in the nervous system when there's a sense of empathy. So he decided to wire up himself and his therapist, who he'd been with for a very long time, and, and just record through galvanic skin response, you can tell what branch of the nervous system you're in. So he, he did that, and then he went through, after they did this session, and the interesting thing about the session is his therapist hardly says anything. He says, he makes listening noises and he says a few words now and then, but he doesn't say much of anything. He's just there being very present. Mm -hmm. So then Carl went through and looked at this, at, this, at this session again and marked off the places in the session where he felt particularly connected to his therapist. And then they paired that with what it showed on the galvanic skin response. And the places where he felt the most empathy was where the two nervous systems were tracking. Like his therapist and his nervous system were together, and then they would separate, and then they would come together again, and then they would separate, and then they would come together again. So wherever there was the pair, wherever they had joined at a nervous system level with no words most of the time is where the empathy blossomed in the room. So, wow. so much of this is body to body. So now a therapist could think, well, if, if let's say Carl was really anxious and his therapist's nervous system, would it have to get anxious with him? Well, yes, in resonance we do. But if our own inner system is not um, overwhelmed with anxiety, we can resonate with the person's anxiety without falling fully into it. And that's because of something called inhibitory mirror neurons that we could explain, that, that let us know below the level of conscious awareness that this anxiety that I'm feeling isn't mine. It belongs to this person, but I'm resonating with them. But it's not mine. It's not stirring up implicit stuff in me. 
So we can even be with people in a resonant state that are highly upset as long as our own system doesn't get doesn't get awakened in a way that we are also tapping into our own, say, anxiety or fear or whatever the emotion is, shame, whatever it might be. And that when we are in that resonance is when the other person feels known in a way that was palpable to Marcy in this experiment. And then he and his colleague, Helen Reese, did this with a lot of other people. But I thought it was really cool that he did it with his own therapist first. Well, it, it takes this idea that we're hardwired for connection to a new level. And you're also your idea of ther therapy as a spiritual, spiritual practice too. Um, something I was kind of curious to ask you, Bonnie, um, just given, I suppose, the the width and and uh the breadth and the depth of your your thought um let's imagine hypothetically that you were given control of the education system worldwide here for a moment right and you were responsible for designing an educational program for young people in schools all over the world and the aim is basically to create a better society what are some of what how might you approach it? What would, what would you include in that in that program? I know this is a small question to, to wrap up, but I just I wanted to ask you. Well, the first thing I do is call my good friend Kirk Olson, who wrote the book The Invisible Classroom, and we could sum up what he says that in there called connection before curriculum, and we begin to Ooh. help the teachers and the and the principals and the super and the superintendents of schools. And all of the people that are responsible for teach, for the teaching all the way up to begin to understand that what needs to happen is, is that there needs to be a different paradigm about what matters in the classroom, but it has to start at the top because otherwise the top's going to be operating in the left hemisphere and you cannot try to, you cannot expect teachers to make this shift without getting support from higher up. And then we begin to do some learning and education around the autonomic nervous system and how true learning is correlated with being in a safe environment where you can be in what's called the ventral vagal parasympathetic, which means this kind of open to learning safe space inside yourself. That's when learning happens. When we're in sympathetic arousal and we're scared, that shuts down because we have to be attending to threat adaptively. It's not wrong. It's what we're supposed to be doing. So we would begin with enough, at least education, and then everybody else would need to be getting the support, layers and layers and layers of support, so that their systems could begin, as the ones who are the educators, to be in a more ventral state, a more open, safe state, and inviting that and then allowing the kids who are often coming in from a lot of fear and everything else out in the world to be embraced by this so they'd be more open to learning and also experiencing relationships that really matter to them. That's got to um, be the so whole system. You can't have a level of teachers. There's too much pressure on them. They're scared all the time. They have to meet this standard and that standard. And it's really pretty crazy. And we don't take into account that you have students coming into this, into the classroom that are scared they're going to get shot, that are worried because the world is collapsing around them and the heat is so bad they can't even walk home from school. And they expect these kids to learn. Yeah. There's no safety. There's no sense in, you know, and occasionally I had some of these magical teachers that yet still, in spite of everything, I mean, back in my day, we were hiding under the desk because we were going to get blown up by atomic bombs. You know, that's how old I am. But that, so there's always been these fearful things that come in. But I remember the difference in the classroom when I had a teacher who held such a presence that we all felt sheltered and man, did we learn. They were wonderful, wow. wonderful teachers um, because they could hold that space. I can tell you've actually given this some thought. That's a really great answer. And <laughs> it goes better about Stephen Porges and safety being a biological imperative, you know, and sort of that would definitely help to create a more ventral vagal world where people just feel safe and connected and um, that's how we could thrive, you know. Um, and then we're open to learning. I mean, it's when you think about it, when something is scaring you, your whole attention narrows to the thing that's frightening you, as it should, because you have to protect yourself. That's adaptive. So if you have teachers and students 
who are scared, they're focusing on a single thing and their system is not open to learning in a broad way. Okay, so last couple of questions, Bonnie. Um, who in the world, you know, if you could have a conversation with anybody, um, who would you most like to connect with and have a dialogue with at, at this present moment? So let's say, I don't know, two or three people. Who would, if you had that opportunity, who would you want to connect with? I mean, it's, it's so it's so interesting because the only people that really come to my mind are the people I'm already really close with, where I could feel like I could have a, a warm and vulnerable kind of conversation, you know, where I feel like I've really been fortunate to have these people in my life. I, I Steve Porges is one of the most gracious people on the planet. And so he's somebody that I would love to connect with. I don't immediately think of people where I'd be trying to persuade them of something different because I know that's fruitless. You know, I mean, that's just not how it works. So I don't I, I don't think I have a good answer. Like I, I would like to actually um, I have a, I have a close friend who worked with Biden when he was vice president on the Violence Against Women um, Act. And they were there were women and women who were leaders in domestic violence. She's a really close friend of mine. And um, her his response to them makes me feel like I would enjoy talking to Joe Biden because of his openness to these kinds of things that are about kindness and how do we bring wow. more of it in the world. So Have you had any dialogues with Ian McGilchrist before? Yes, I got to interview Ian, I guess, back in 2014 and did an article for a magazine about that. I would love to talk to Ian again. Yeah, that would be really, really, we had a very good time with very that cool. interview. Yeah, Stephen... Ian. Yeah, <laughs> Joe Biden. <laughs> but again, not because he's president, not because he's president, but because I know he's open to these kinds yeah. of yeah, things. For sure. Okay, so just to wrap yeah. up here, um, for anybody listening to this that's maybe been inspired by anything that you've you've said, and what would you like them to leave this conversation with? And maybe it could be an action or even just a thought that you'd like them to leave with. Um, what comes to mind for you there? Well, kind relationships matter and anything we can do to improve that capacity in ourselves to be able to offer that, I think is very good for the world. Um, our, I will say our website is nurturingtheheart.org and you know, we offer for therapists in particular trainings and things like that that are centered on becoming present. And we're doing this thing with PCPSI right now that is with, with Liam that's all about practicing presence. So those are those are some resources that are available that I'm aware of and and all of that. But again, find a listening partner or two or three or six and and begin to practice. Begin to practice. This feels so much better than meanness. It's hard to imagine that how much meanness there is in the world. For sure. And you've got quite a few books out there as well, Bonnie. That, um, if someone wants to get started with a book of yours, where would be a good starting point? Well, I think they've kind of built. And so I would say nurturing the heart. I mean, the heart of trauma is probably the one because that feels to me like it has the most of the synthesis in after years and years of study. So heart of trauma is probably a as good a place as any to begin. Okay. Awesome. Well, Bonnie, it's been an absolute delight to um, speak with you today and thank you so much for sharing some of your, some of your wisdom with us. It's been, thank it's been an absolute you. pleasure. So I want to wish you the very best going forward with all of your, your teaching and everything that you continue to do. And I hope we can get a chance to connect again at some point in the future. That would be lovely.